Welcome to our virtual chat with Lois Lowry. My name is Miss Sarah and I'm the children's librarian here at the Lewiston Public Library. Now, while we are waiting for all of our patrons and all of our wonderful people to join us, um, I'm just gonna do a couple of library mentions. Um, so I just did wanna mention that um, the Lewiston Public Library Children's Department is open uh, for appointments. So if you are interested in coming to the library to browse and look for books, we have three one hour appointments, uh, Monday through Friday. We have one at 11 a.m., one at 3 p.m., and one at 5.30, and you get a, a whole hour to come in and browse. Um, for Fridays, we do close at five, so it's just the first two appointments. But you can just call and make an appointment uh, and just, we would love to see you at the library and come pick them up. But of course, if you don't want to come into the library, you can always choose our LPL to go. So you can put books on hold uh, and then come pick them up with our curbside service. I also wanted to mention that on December 22nd at 2 p.m., we have a virtual performer, uh, Judy Panko. She's going to be doing some silly songs. So we'd love for you to join us uh, and do some silly songs uh, during the holidays. And then we also, please don't forget on Tuesdays, every single Tuesday, we have our story time with Miss Jackie. It's at 1030 every Tuesday. So tomorrow we have one and Miss Jackie's actually doing a winter theme if you want to come bundle up with Miss Jackie and do a stories. And so um, all you have to do is email our lplkids at lewistonmaine.gov and uh, we'll email you the link so that you can join the Zoom for our story time. All right, well, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. So let me give you a brief overview of our program today. So I'm gonna start today with an introduction and then Lois Lowry is gonna dazzle you with her presentation. <laughs> and then I'm gonna open it up for questions. So if you have a question that you would like to ask, please type it into the Q&A box at any time, or if you're watching on Facebook, you can always type a question into the comment box. And uh, at the end, I will ask as many of everyone's questions as possible. All right, so Lois Lowry is a beloved children's author, photographer, mother and grandmother, and Mainer. She was born the middle child of three in Hawaii and grew up in New York and Tokyo with her father in the army. She lived in a world of books and her own imagination. At age 25, Lois had four children, all under the age of five, and went back to college and began to study writing. Now, Lois Lowry is the author of more than 30 books, including The Giver Quartet and Number the Stars, and two-time Newbery medalist. She's received many honors and awards, including the Boston Horn Book Award and the Mark Twain Award. Several of her books have been adapted to movies, including The Giver, starring Jeff Bridges, who I hear stays in touch with Lois sometimes, <laughs> and Meryl Streep. Most recently, The Willoughbys was adapted to an animated feature where children hatch a sneaky plan to send their very selfish parents on vacation. Lois is known for writing about difficult subject matters and complex themes and works for young audiences. One general theme resonates through all her books, the importance of human connections. She's interested in how memory works and what we learn from it. Her newest book, On the Horizon, is a collection of memories, some of them her own, and images from Pearl Harbor, Hiroshima, and post-war Japan. Her writing contemplates humanity and war through verse that sings with pain, truth, and the importance of bridging cultural divides. Now is the time, and more important than ever, that we care more and do more for one another. My great pleasure to introduce Lois Lowry. Take it away. Ta-da. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. It's great to be here with all of you. Um, the introductory materials from the library said I was gonna focus on my two new books, uh, and I am gonna do that. But if anybody has questions, and I know they always have questions about a couple of my older books, they can certainly type in, or you can certainly type in questions about any book you want. 
uh, and I'll, I'll, assuming we have time, I'll answer those as well. But uh, what I'm gonna do at first is turn this over to a visual presentation. Uh, it will be my voice. I'll be sitting here in my kitchen in Falmouth, Maine, talking to you, but I'm gonna be showing you pictures because I think it's always more fun to have something to look at instead of just looking at a talking head. And I'm going to uh, head there now. Ta-da, here we are. Um, and I find that I, when I began to put this together, I realized it was gonna be three books and not, not just two, because I've actually had a third book come out, out uh, this year. And I'm gonna mention that first. Okay, it's this one. It's the same book, two copies of it. The first one on the left was published, gosh, I don't know what year, some years ago, maybe 10 years ago. And you can see that it's set in Portland, Maine. Because of the circumstances this year in Maine and everywhere, uh, the publisher decided to republish this with, as you can see there, a special new introduction from the author. Uh, this book is set the beginning in Portland, Maine in 1918. I've got a copy of it here in my hand and I'm just gonna read a couple of excerpts. It's written in the form of a diary. This was part of a series done by Scholastic Publishing called the Dear America series. You can see that title on the left. And each book in that series focuses on some event from history seen through the eyes of a child who is on the outskirts or in the midst of such an event, uh, like for example, the Civil War, the, uh, the San Francisco earthquake. I mean, certainly we've had many, many historic events in our, in our past. And this one has to do with, in the first half of the book, uh, the flu epidemic uh, in 1918 and written in the form of a diary by an 11 year old girl who lives in Portland, Maine. Uh, I'm just gonna read from the second page. Uh, it says, she describes that her birthday is coming up. She's going to be 11 and her parents had promised to take her to the movies. You can imagine what movies were like in 1918. They were brand new and uh, very exciting. I went back to old newspapers and found what was playing in Portland, Maine and at the movies and that's what she's to go see. And then she says, but now I am desolate. The Portland Board of Health has issued an order suddenly that no gatherings are to be held at theaters or motion picture houses or dance halls, none at all. And schools are to be closed as well, all because of a sickness that has arrived in Maine. It's called Spanish influenza. I do not know a single person who suffers from it. And I think it is all quite silly. And also it has completely ruined my birthday. A day later on October 5th, she writes this. And, and I found all this information, so it's all true, true for the time uh, in old newspapers. Driving automobiles on Sunday has been outlawed for some time so as to conserve fuel for the war effort. But today it was announced that automobiles may be used tomorrow so that people might have a day in the countryside and away from the crowded parts of the city where infection is spreading. Of course, you can envision what cars were like in 1918. Uh, it was quite an enterprise to go to the country. And this child complains because her family can't afford a car and they don't have one. And she says, I'm wishing that someone with an automobile would invite us for a ride tomorrow. And then she says, again, this actually happened. Beds have been put into the Italian church on 4th Street so that people living in crowded houses where relatives are sick can go there to sleep and get away from the influenza. A day later, she says, even our church on Woodford Street. And if any of you live in Portland, you know where that area is, the Woodford section of Portland. Um, even our church on Woodford Street has closed now and so we could not go to Sunday school today. It's a little frightening and odd, big solid places like churches closing. The Catholic churches are holding their services out of doors, but our church has simply closed. And so we held our own little service at home. <clears throat> That's October 6th. She continues talking about her daily life. 
As for father, she says, she's had a, had a fight with her older brother, Daniel. As for father, he ignored our fuss as he always does and went into the living room and read the newspaper. These days, more news is about the flu than about the war. He says they're making too much of it. He intends to go to work tomorrow and every day to follow and he expects his fellow employees at the store to do the same. He thinks Mayor Clark is a fool to close down a whole city. Later on by the next day, father says a few customers are still coming to the store, but the city streets are quite deserted. And many of those who are out and about are wearing masks. I do not like to picture that in my mind, people with masks, it scares me. <clears throat> Mother said perhaps he should not return to work, but he was shocked at the idea. What if everyone left their jobs, he asked. The city would cease to be. And then it says, still in this child's diary, when mother told, hey, where's the baby, father asked. They have a, a baby sister. And when mother told him, he went to the back porch and kissed Lucy, who was sleeping soundly in her carriage. <clears throat> when I went back and reread this in order to write an introduction to the new edition, I came to that section and I thought, oh, please don't kiss the baby but father does, he kisses Lucy. The next day it says, father came home early and does not want supper. He feels very, very tired. And that of course is the beginning of the end. Uh, that is uh, October 8th and, <clears throat> and within a week, the child's father, mother and baby sister are all dead. The flu uh, that took place in those years, in that particular year, 1918, took a different form, of course, from what we're going through today. And it killed people very, very quickly. The book is really about what happens to this girl and her brother Daniel after they're orphaned uh, by the flu. But because it's so timely, the introductory passages of this book, that's why it's been republished this year. <clears throat> but going on now, <clears throat> people often ask me how I got an idea for a book. And this, as you can see, if you look closely, is a napkin. I was sitting in a coffee shop somewhere, waiting to meet somebody, and uh, picked up a napkin and had a pen in my purse and, and drew this bad picture <clears throat> with these two titles on people, ignominious nanny and truculent benefactor. Once I had drawn these two unattractive people, uh, I went on to create a story in which they were characters. Uh, the truculent benefactor becomes Commander Melanoff in the book and Nanny, she never has any other name, is the ignominious Nanny, is Nanny in the book. And this was uh, the book in its first version, again, published some years ago. Down at the bottom, it says a novel nefariously written and ignominiously illustrated by the author. Uh, every time I see that phrase, I wish I'd written it differently. It should, I want it to say wretchedly written because it would uh, have a little more alliteration with the two W's. Nonetheless, that's what it says. And it is uh, ignominiously illustrated because I am not an illustrator, but the publisher did let me do the illustrations for this first edition of The Willoughby's. Uh, the Willoughby's family contains four children. Let me go back before I get to that one. Uh, the, uh, the eldest is Tim, who's 12. There, then there are twins who are 10 and a little girl, Jane, who's six, as I recall. And uh, the, the problem that they have in the book, because characters in books always have to have problems, that's why you turn the page, <clears throat> is that they have terrible, terrible parents. Uh, their parents are so bad, I don't have time to read you descriptions that would show how bad they are, but uh, one thing they do early in the book is go off on a vacation and uh, leave the children behind. And then they send them a postcard telling them, we have put the house on the market, the house is for sale. Uh, and so that's the reason for this next uh, set of pictures. This is one of my grandsons posing for me so that I could draw an illustration of, this is Tim, the boy in the book. Each time the real estate agent comes to show the house to prospective buyers, the children 
disguise themselves. And uh, in this section, Tim uh, puts coats and hats all over himself and disguises himself as a, hat, uh, a coat tree. Uh, the little girl Jane disguises herself as a lamp. Uh, one of the twins, <laughs> I've forgotten what the twins are disguised as. Take my word for it though, it's something bizarre. Uh, and uh, so that's the Willoughby's as it was. That book was around for a long time. I think it was on the New York Times bestseller list. And this is its new cover. And the reason it has a new cover, as you can see, it's a soon to be a Netflix film. When the publisher discovered that it would be a Netflix film, which it now is, they asked me to write a sequel and they put a new cover on the book, which will match the cover on the sequel. Here you can see Jane with the glasses, Tim with a T on his shirt, and the twins who have the same name, Barnaby and Barnaby, and who are inside the same sweater. That's because their parents were too lazy to think of a second name, and the mother who does knit uh, is too lazy to knit two sweaters. There is Nanny. And there is Commander Melanoff. Uh, Nanny is hired by the parents when they go off on this extended trip. And uh, Commander Melanoff appears later in the story. And there in the wagon is a baby, because one of the things that happens is that a baby is left on their doorstep in a basket. Uh, one of the things that gives you evidence of what a bad mother Mrs. Willoughby is, um, they bring the baby inside and, and the boys, the three boys kind of cringe. They say, oh, it's ugly. We don't want a baby. And Jane says, I think it's kind of cute. It has curls. Mother stands there for a minute and then she goes to her knitting basket and takes out a pair of scissors. She leans over the basket and goes snip, snip, snip. And then she says, now it doesn't have curls and it is ugly. Okay, so uh, that was to be a movie. And now it is a movie, and if you go to Netflix, you can watch the movie, <laughs> but as you can see, the book characters look very different than they did in, in the book or in my illustrations or in my imagination. There are the four kids. Uh, they're kind of long and skinny with very pointed noses. Uh, Tim, the oldest, is holding a brochure from the travel agency, which is uh, going to send their parents on a vacation. Jane is holding a cat. Uh, in the book, the kids do have a cat, uh, but in the movie, the cat is much more important because the cat narrates the whole story. And then on the left, there are Barnaby and Barnaby, the twins. They all have very strange <laughs> hair and very strange noses and bodies. Uh, and it's because movies are different from books. Uh, this is Nanny. On the left is Nanny as I, created her for the book. And on the right is the nanny of the movie who is very different. And she's wearing overalls and has extremely large hair. So um, because the movie was in the process of being made and the publisher had asked me to write a sequel to the book, I had to figure out what to do uh, with the Willoughby's in a sequel. And the movie people would not allow me to read the script. So I didn't know exactly what they were doing. And often a movie is different from the book and this one is, but in the book, uh, at the end of the book, <laughs> the parents, of course, I've told you they were bad parents are trying to get rid of the children and the children are trying to get rid of the parents and the children are the ones who succeed at the end. And the parents off on this ill-fated vacation at the end of the book are frozen solid at the top of one of the Alps. They have decided to climb a mountain and they've worn Bermuda shorts and sandals and uh, they have no uh, knowledge of how to do mountain climbing and they end up frozen solid. It says they look like popsicles on top of an Alp and people can put a quarter into a telescope uh, if you're standing at a scenic viewpoint and, and uh, see the two frozen Americans, uh, but they're in a place where nobody can rescue them. So there they are frozen forever at the end of the book. I did not know how the movie would end and the publisher said, just write the book, the second book 
according to the ending in the first book. So that's what I did. Here is the Willoughby's on the left, and here is the new book. In fact, it says advanced reading copy, not for sale. Uh, that was true when I photographed this book, but uh, now the book is quite available and for sale and the Willoughby's return. Uh, what happens is global warming. 30 years pass, the ice melts in the Alps, the parents are defrosted, but amazingly, they're the same age they were when they were frozen. So they make their way home or back to where they lived very gradually and with difficulty, uh, but they don't realize what will soon become obvious that their children are now older than they are. So clearly that presents a problem. And as I told you, books need problems. That's why you turn the pages. But when I gave the manuscript to the publisher, they said, that's all fine, but it's not enough plot. It needs another problem. So I went back and rewrote it. Uh, authors always end up rewriting books, revising manuscripts. And on the very first page of The Willoughby's Return, it describes the front page of the New York Times and a headline that says, Congress votes overwhelmingly to ban candy, citing dental health. Okay, dentists have gotten together lobbied Congress and made candy illegal. And that presents a huge problem because if you've read the first book, you know that the children having been abandoned by their parents, the four children have been adopted by a billionaire. There he is uh, with his pipe on the cover of the first book. And there he is older, still with his pipe on the cover of the second. And he's holding a newspaper on the cover of the second book, it says bad news. That's the news about candy becoming illegal. Because Commander Melanoff has made his billions of dollars by being a manufacturer of candy. And now it's against the law to make candy, to sell candy, to buy candy, to eat candy. And so he is headed to bankruptcy. Now, another thing has happened, 30 years have passed he had adopted the Willoughby children. And now Tim, who was 12 in the first book, is now an adult. He now runs the factory because Commander Melanoff has gotten old. And he has a wife and he has a little boy whom he and his wife have named Rich. So uh, a lot of things are happening. The parents are making their way back, not realizing that time has stopped. Uh, candy is illegal and, the, and, the, and Tim Willoughby and his family and his little boy named Rich are, are about to become poor. I'll just tell you one, I think, kind of funny thing that uh, Richie does. Richie, like probably the children of any billionaire, is allowed to go to his computer and order anything he wants. And so he constantly orders toys for himself. And I just went to catalogs online and copied descriptions of very expensive toys. And here's a scene. Uh, this is just after his father has discovered the news of the law against candy and uh, is sitting devastated in the dining room with his coffee at breakfast, reading this newspaper. And Richie's there and uh, doesn't realize what's going on. And Richie says, is it okay if I go out and play? His father stared at him. What do you plan to play with? Richie thought for a minute. Uh, my Fire Pulse Innovation Top Grain Leather Basketball. That's a description I took out of a toy catalog. Is that new, his father asked. Yes, I ordered it last week and it just came yesterday. I'm not sure if I like it yet. I might get a Spalding TF-1000. Richie had always been allowed to order whatever toys or gadgets he wanted. His father rose from his seat, went to his son and put his arm around him. Richie, he said, we're going to have to cut back. Huh? You go ahead outside to play with your basketball, but don't order anything else because we are destitute. We've been destroyed. Destroyed, asked Richie. Yes, his father said, by dentists. 
Uh, I, I think that's kind of funny because I haven't liked dentists. My father was a dentist, but uh, in, this, in this particular book, the dentists are the villains. Of course, everything turns out happily in the end and a lot of other things happen along the way before you get to the happy ending. So that's this one. And uh, I'm gonna go on now to show you, this is my mother and my sister who was three years older than I. I was sorry I couldn't find a picture of mother reading to me because she did uh, all the time. My mother had been a teacher before she was married. Uh, but this is my sister and this is my sister reading to me. Uh, my sister actually was the one who taught me to read before I went to school. I'm the little one there on the left. My sister was three years older. This kind of dazzling photograph is actually the hospital where I was born. And if you ever go to Hawaii and you fly into Honolulu Airport and then you take a taxi into the city, you will pass this hospital on your left uh, with the beautiful mountains behind. Tripler Hospital, that's where I was born. And as you can see, uh, it was in Hawaii. And there's my sister again. I'm probably one year old here and she would have been four. And the fact that I was born in Hawaii became the starting place for the other book that was published this year. And I'll explain that in a minute. Of course, this is what happened in December of 1941. We've just passed this date, December 7th. Uh, 1,500 dead in Hawaii and Congress votes war. Uh, December 7th, 1941 uh, was the date that Pearl Harbor was bombed. Uh, we had left Hawaii before then, but I remember being in 41, I was four years old, four and a half at that point. Uh, and I remember being aware, it's one of my early memories, uh, my parents hearing this news on the radio. And I, I recognized Hawaii because it had been our, our home for so long. This is my father in his army uniform just before he went off to the Pacific. By this time, my mother was expecting a baby. And so she took my sister and me after dad left and went back to Pennsylvania to the house where she had grown up. And we moved in with our grandparents. And that's where we lived when my baby brother was born. And my father was uh, off in the Pacific at the war. Uh, this house, incidentally, uh, you can see the doorway there. And uh, this house is now the Landis house. My grandfather's last name was Landis. And it's now uh, an official house belonging to Dickinson College, which is in this town in Pennsylvania, where I spent those years during the war. I kind of love that it's the women's center uh, there. And it looks to me as though they've made the the doorway more substantial than it was when I was a child. Uh, this is me, probably 1942. I was five years old here. Uh, I was a very, what do I want to say? Curious child, you can see that. I was, I was very quiet, introspective, shy, uh, kind of scholarly, I loved books. Uh, for a brief time, I had glasses when I was a little girl and then didn't after that. I don't know why not. And now I have glasses again now that I'm old. Uh, but here I am with my little brother, Johnny. And here's the library in the town where I spent those childhood years. And I, I put this in just because it was my, even though I was taken every Sunday to Sunday school at the Presbyterian Church, this was really my church. Uh, this was the place I most loved and it was near my grandfather's home from the time I was six years old. I could walk to the library by myself and I remembered it all my life uh, as, as I remembered what I thought of uh, as a hundred marble steps going up into the library that I so loved. And when I went back to that town actually to make a speech at that library, I discovered it was only 12 cement steps. But nonetheless, it does have a kind of monumental look to it, the way libraries should, and many of them do. Uh, that library had been in the town for a very long time. My mother had gone to that library when she was a little girl. And on the internet, I found the rules for that library when my mother was a child um, from October to May. Books could be borrowed for two weeks 
two books at a time provided they shall not both be fiction. Isn't that interesting? I wonder why. Patrons had to be persons above the age of 12 years of cleanly habits and good reputation. Uh, I was younger than 12, but by the time I came along, little girls could have a library card. I think I had cleanly habits and I probably had a good reputation. And then eventually, of course, in 1945, Japan surrendered and the war was over. My father came home briefly and then he had to return to Japan. And uh, he told us when he came home that he would bring us there to live. We had to wait a while until Japan was ready to have American women and children come over. And here I am at 10 years old and I've put in here, I think it's coming up. Uh, yes, I had read this long before I was 10. Um, this was in my third grade classroom. There was a series of books by Lucy Fitch Perkins and uh, each one was about a set of twins from different countries. And I had loved this book. And when I was 10, thinking about moving to Japan, goodness, looking, look how skinny my arms were. Uh, I envisioned that I would be living like these children, wearing a kimono and Japanese shoes and sleeping on the floor. But when I got there, uh, here's Tokyo in the days that I arrived. Tokyo had been badly bombed and burned and they had hastily thrown up housing for American women and children who were coming. And this was the very ugly place where I lived. Not at all what I had expected. Uh, but there's my bicycle. My father had bought me a bicycle. There are the wonderful maids that we had in the house. That's me at 11 years old. And uh, I loved my time in Japan. And I used that bicycle to ride out of that ugly place where I lived uh, into the city of Tokyo, which was quite safe. I did not wear Japanese clothing except on special occasions. And this appears to be Christmas. You can see the wreath on the door. This is my little brother. Jap uh, Japan has a holiday each year. Uh, Boys day is May 5th and Japanese families hang a fish, a carp. Uh, if they have two sons, they hang two. If they have three sons, they hang three. We only had Johnny. There is also a girl's day, but this was Johnny's, Johnny's day. And this was my much loved bicycle. I'm, I'm talking fast and moving fast because we, I wanna to get to questions and, and I got a lot of stuff to cover here. But this is the area of Japan where I live. This picture was taken somewhat later. Uh, the cars I'm looking at are, are cars that are newer than the cars we had in, in the late 1940s. Uh, but but uh, it's typical of, of uh, the residential area of Tokyo outside of the place where I lived. And this is the book that has emerged out of these various memories. I love the cover of this book. This is me when he originally did the illustration and I saw a picture of it, he had me with very dark hair, but I was actually a very blonde child and that's mentioned later in the book. So I asked him to change it. And, and the reason this is on the cover, me with either my grandmother or my nursemaid, I'm not sure who they, which one that is, uh, and the horizon with ship on it is for this reason. The book is divided into three parts and the first part is about Pearl Harbor. My grandmother came to Honolulu to live with us when I was born. The book takes the form of, of poetry. It's written in that, in that uh, genre. And this is my grandmother visited. She had come by train across the broad land from her home in Wisconsin, then by ship. We met her and heaped wreaths of plumeria around her neck. Aloha, we said to her, welcome, hello. I called her Nani. She took me down by the ocean. The sea moved in a blue-green rhythm soft against the sand and we played there, she and I, with a small shovel and laughed when the breeze caught my bonnet and lifted it from my blonde hair. We played and giggled calm, serene, and there behind us, slow, unseen, Arizona, great gray tomb, moved majestic toward her doom. 
there this is lifted out of a video a video which was made from an old home movie and there i am on the beach with my grandmother waikiki and there in the background is the uss arizona battleship i didn't know that that was in the background of that film until i was an adult and uh, a friend who saw the film uh, pointed it out to me he'd been a naval officer uh, and he'd been there at pearl harbor not when it was bombed but later and and he knew the outline of this ship the silhouette the uss arizona was sunk that day in december 7th and if you go there now to honolulu this is a memorial built on top of the ship which you can see through the water below it. And uh, once I realized that that ship was in the background of my childhood happiness, uh, I, I was kind of haunted by it. And I began to think about and eventually to look up and read about the men who died on that ship that day. There were over 1,100 young men and they are still there in that ship. Their bodies have never been brought out of the ship. And uh, their names are engraved inside the memorial. And so I began to find what information I could about these young men. And I used a few of them in the book, uh, just selected them. You know, I read about many, many young men and every now and then one's, one would leap out at me and, and uh, that would be the one I would include in the book. And here is one, James Myers. James was from Missouri and had two brothers. The older boy had died in France in World War I. The youngest, out in a field, bringing in the cows when a storm struck, was killed by lightning. He was 15. So James was left. He married and had two sons himself, but his wife died young. And the little boys, Jimmy and Gordon, went to live with their grandma in Seattle. It was the other grandma widowed Mary Myers in Missouri, who opened the telegram with dread. I had bad luck with all my boys, she said. It was that quotation from an old newspaper article that, that grabbed my attention and that made me include James Myers in the book. And I'm glad I did because not long ago, this past May, I got an email from James Meyer. He said, this is from Gordon Myers. He said, James Myers was my father and the two boys are my brother, Jimmy and myself. Uh, it's, it's a reminder of how connected we are. Gordon Myers doesn't say how old he is, but he's probably in his eighties as I am. All these years have passed and yet he and I have this connection to one another. I was so pleased to, to get this email from him. The second part of the book takes place five years later, uh, another morning at 8.15, um, and uh, this was another place, Hiroshima. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to do this very quickly, but here's a map of Japan. You can see Tokyo, where I later went to live, and you can see where Hiroshima is down in southern Japan. I spent summers on an island in what they call the Inland Sea, Itajima, there uh, you can see the island and just below Hiroshima. But the important thing here, this is the Inland Sea, which is so beautiful, dotted with islands. The important thing is this little marker down on the left, a little town called Tabuse. If you look up, you see Itajima, where, where I spent summers, and you can see Hiroshima. But look at Tabuse, and here in the book, as a little boy in a small town called Tabuse on August 5th, the summer day, a little boy, Koichi Sei, felt a shudder in the earth and saw the sky change. From Hiroshima, miles away, beyond the hills, beside the bay on August 5th, the summer day, Koichi san perceived the birth of something strange. Is this how it ends? The world this way? On August 5th, the summer day, morning light, a boy at play, it could, it might, it may. Koichi say was a real boy. He was about to have his eighth birthday and he saw the bomb 50 miles away. He saw the light in the sky. He saw the sky change color. And then his mother very soon knew what had happened uh, in Hiroshima. And she took her children, Koichi and his sister and moved within weeks up to Tokyo uh, where he grew up. 
This is what Hiroshima looked immediately like after the bomb. Uh, you can see a building still standing on the right. That building is still there today. It's part of the Peace Memorial. This is the, uh, the Peace Museum in Hiroshima. And this is a little tricycle uh, that you'll see if you visit that museum. Soon four years old, a big boy. Shinichi Tatsutani played that morning riding his red tricycle. When his parents found him, he was still gripping the handlebar. He was so proud of his red tricycle. Shin-san, they called him. They buried him in the garden and with him, they buried his red tricycle. Many years later, his parents, old by then, uh, dug up that grave and moved their child's bones to the family cemetery and they donated his tricycle to the museum where you can still stand and see it. Uh, if you can see through the tears that will come to your eyes. The third part of the book is in Tokyo where I moved still as a child uh, to that ugly house I described and where I spent uh, my early adolescent years and had that bicycle. And here is Koichi Sei. And there he is circled in his classroom below there. And there am I. He and I are the same age. Uh, we send birthday cards now to each other. My birthday is in March, his is in August. So uh, we're a few months apart. I'm the older one. Um, I used to ride that bike past a Japanese school and I would stop there and stare at the children and this little boy stared back at me. Beside a school, I paused one day and watched some children run and play. We were curious, I know that's true. Their eyes were dark and mine were blue. I braked my bike and watched them there. I saw them eye my pale blonde hair. They looked at me and I at them. So why were we so silent, mute and shy? I smiled before I rode away, but never met Koichi Sei until so many years went by that he was gray haired, so was I. I'd lived in his country then, and now he'd moved to mine. So when we met, his name was Alan now, we mused and pondered how from our horizons we had viewed a war begin, a war conclude. We were young, we were alike. Boy in a schoolyard, girl on a bike. And here is Koichi Sei, now Alan, and his wife, Mickey. Uh, his last name is Americanized to S-A-Y now. And uh, he has become a very distinguished illustrator and he lives in the United States now. And uh, I, I hear from him often. And here we are having lunch together, uh, not terribly long ago, but of course, before the pandemic overtook us. So again, uh, an example of how our lives are connected and the tragedy of war and, and what happens uh, to children. Okay, I'm gonna go back now to uh, here so that I can answer questions which let us hope have been coming in. If not, Sarah, you'll have to make them up. Will do. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, what a fascinating story with uh, you and Koichi. I just, uh, especially coming together all those years later and really it, it, that is that bridging that cultural divide and getting to come together and share stories. I just love that. And I also have to say, I love the picture of that library and uh, when you were a child. And yes, we always think about, I think about so, some rooms uh, in the libraries I was in when I was a child. They're so much bigger than uh, when I come now. They're yes, tiny. yes. <laughs> and Can I just, just tell you a funny thing about maybe every little girl in a library, but me, I would come home from the library and and, and play librarian. My older sister was in school. I hadn't started school yet. So I would line up my dolls and my books. And I would say to a doll, I think you would like this book about ice skating. And, and I would take the book and I would do this to it. I don't know if you can see my hands. I would, I would thump it. 
because that's what the librarian did. I didn't know what she did at that desk. To me, it was magic. She did something funny, thumped the book, and then it was mine. Uh, I didn't realize until long after that she had a stamp with the date and she was stamping the date. But I would sit there in my bedroom saying, here's a lovely book about uh, elves and hand it, thump it and hand it to my teddy bear. <laughs> I love that. I know just the things we think of in our minds. And I love the uh, that you could only check out two books and they wouldn't couldn't both be only fiction. one could be fiction. Right? And just how far libraries have come. Right. Like you can yes. check out 30 books today yeah. and they can be whatever you want. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much. Um, so I do have a question about. Uh, so what inspired you to write on the horizon at this time? Well, you know, it was a number of years ago, I can't put a date on it, but it was in the 1990s when the friend pointed out to me that the Arizona was in the background of that picture. And it began to haunt me. And I began to read about the young man who had died on that ship. Incidentally, 37 pairs of brothers on that ship and one pair of one set of twins. Uh, but I didn't know what to do with it. I mean, it's not a, there's not a plot really. And, and the fragments kept coming to me. And uh, eventually it evolved. And I don't recall a specific moment when I thought, oh, this is what I'll do. But at some point uh, it, it all fell into place and took that form of writing fragments. And that's why it's a book of, of individual poems as opposed to a narrative with a plot and characters and dialogue and all, all of that. Okay, thank you. Um, now also, um, what, during your time in Tokyo, I know that story of uh, living in the American community versus living in Tokyo. Um, that kind of inspired your idea for The Giver. Could you talk a little bit about that? Oh, yes. Well, let me think about the connection. Um, I mentioned the bicycle. The, the area where we lived, which is all gone now. It's all, I've been back to Tokyo a number of times and those ugly houses are all gone. It's now a park. But when we lived there, the houses were surrounded by a wall uh, and there was a, a gate and uh, we weren't locked in there. And I was able to ride my bike out of that gate into the community. But uh, it, it when I later asked my parents, we weren't required to live there. And others of my friends in school lived in houses in the city of Tokyo, probably sadly houses that had been taken from wealthy people and commandeered and given to Americans to live in. But I asked my mother after many years later when I was an adult, I said, why did you choose to have us live in that ugly Washington Heights, as it was called, instead of you know, immersing ourselves in a different culture and living in a Japanese house. And she said, oh, well, we thought it would make you feel safe and comfortable. It would be more like home. And uh, you know that was exactly what I was looking to get away from when I got on that bike at 12 years old. I wanted to not feel safe and not feel comfortable. I wanted to be out there where there was diversity and things of, of cultural difference. And so I think when I, when I set out to write The Giver, I created a community of people who are very safe and very comfortable and very deprived of any kind of richness that that uh, could be available to us if we would let ourselves be open to it and and it's I wasn't conscious when I wrote the section but now I of, of doing it for this reason but now I can see there was a connection of putting that boy on a bicycle and having him leave that community and go out into the world to seek something better isn't that interesting just how, again, you talk a lot about memory and so maybe having those memories as a child and how they kind of unfold in your stories. So I find that so interesting. Um, uh, we do have a question on here. So uh, how did you and Alan discover that you had seen each other as children? Oh, that's kind of a funny story. Um, I had written the book called The Giver, which was awarded the Newbery Medal in 1994. And Alan, whom I didn't know, had illustrated 
grandfather's journey, which was awarded the same year, uh, the Caldecott Medal for illustration. And those two medals are given in the same event. And it's a very lavish, formal, wonderful dinner with a zillion librarians there. It's at the annual meeting of the American Library Association. And that year it was held in Miami. So I went there to attend that dinner and receive that medal. And I had breakfast. Somebody arranged for me to breakfast with Alan and he gave me a copy of Grandfather's Journey. I should have taken it out of the bookcase. I could hold it up and he had, signed his name and draw a little cartoon of himself in it. So I gave him a copy of The Giver and I wrote my name and, and then I wrote my name in Japanese and that made him chuckle when he looked at it. And then he said, how come you can do that? And I said, well, I used to live in Japan. And, and then we went through this, where did you live Tokyo? So did I, what part of Tokyo? Uh, so did I. And, and then suddenly as we got farther and farther down, he suddenly said, were you the girl on the green bicycle? And of course that was a zillion years later. I, I, it would have been 1949 that I was on that green bicycle and this would have been 1994. And I can't do the math quickly, 50, 51 plus four. At any rate, it was many years later. <laughs> Uh, and, and so that began what has proven to be a very a valuable friendship. Oh, that's so wonderful to see each other so many years later and to yeah. find out who you were. I mean, uh, a lot of stories, you know, you wouldn't have found out later that you knew each other. So and uh, he, when he emails me, I, I, I can always tell it's coming from Alan in the, in the subject line. It always says Ikaga, which means... Ikaga Desuka means, how, how are you? <laughs> uh, so which of your books is most personal to you? Uh, which of my books is the most personal? On the Horizon, of course, is. But I have another uh, kind of memoir called Looking Back, which goes through my entire life up from, there's a picture of me the day I was born. Uh, in those days, most people didn't have a picture of their baby a few hours old, but my father was on the staff of the hospital, so he was allowed in to take my picture. And it concludes that book, uh, looking back with me now. Uh, and it's mostly photographs and things written about the photographs. But years ago, I did a novel called Autumn Street, which is one of my favorite of my books. And it's a fictionalized, and it's told through the eyes of a little girl who is only six years old, but is not a book for six-year-olds. And it takes place in the small Pennsylvania town where I lived in my grandfather's house. And it's about my friendship with a black child my age, who was the grandchild of my grandparents' cook, if you can put that all together. My grandparents had a cook who I was very fond of. She had a grandchild who was in real life a little girl named Gloria. In the book, I changed that child to a boy named him Charles. Gloria, the real Gloria, was murdered. And in the book, the boy Charles is murdered, which is why it's a book for older, uh, not, not for young children. Uh, but that is the book that is most personal to me and which I feel closest to. Wonderful. It's nice to feel so connected to your work. And um, I know we all do. So um, we have another question. Uh, I really, this is a really great one. Um, do you have any other writing projects on the horizon uh, that we can look forward to after 2020? Uh, yes, and I'm not going to talk about it very much because I find if I talk about something I'm working on, then I go back to work on it and it's, it's disappeared from my imagination. It's gone out there when I talked about it. Uh, but I will say that uh, I have I've just, I've, I've written some of it and it's a very complicated book requiring a lot of research and I suddenly thought, I don't want to keep doing all this hard work if nobody's going to publish it. So this is the first time I've done this. Usually I've written a book, given it to the publisher and they see the finished product. But this time I gave them probably one fourth of a book and an outline of what I was doing. And it's very different from any of my other books. So I was nervous about 
you know, publishers are people who have to make money. They love books, but they're a business and they have to make money. And so that's what they have to consider. And you give them a book, as I did, that's very different from my other books. They're going to start thinking, ah, you know, we kind of wish you'd written another book like The Giver, which we know would make money. So I was sitting here waiting to hear back. And indeed, I've just heard back this week that, yes, they're going to publish this new book. And the deadline for the completed manuscript is April 1st. So when I leave this kitchen, uh, I'm going to go back to my computer and continue work on this uh, complex uh, book, which is, and one of the reasons is so different is because it's both fiction and nonfiction combined. It goes back and forth. It deals with some real events that we don't know a lot about. And so it creates a story from those events, but it keeps going back to the real events. So that's all I'm gonna tell you. And it, I'm not even gonna tell you the, the tentative title. Well, I know we'll wait in anticipation till it comes okay. back. <laughs> <It's very exciting. laughs> um, I, this is a really great question also uh, about that's in our Q and A. Um, so you have your themes of human connections and memories uh, through your books. And was that intentional to have that as a theme through your work or did that uh, emerge and become apparent over time through your writing? I don't, uh, somebody recently I had to fill out an interview questions and, and there was a question about uh, the morals in books. What is the moral of your book? And uh, I don't even think about things like that. Um, I don't think kids, which is by and large my audience, ever go to a library and say to a librarian, would you find me a book that has a great moral uh, and that teaches me something? And, uh, and you know, what they want is, would you find me a book with a character that I love who has adventures that I can relate to? So I don't think in those terms, but what I do find is that after I create stories, and characters to go in the stories. And, and what, what occurs to me first always is characters and, and, and a place and, and, and something that they're facing, uh, something that's not quite right that they have to solve. And so that becomes the plot. And then by the time the book is finished, then I can look back at it and say, oh, this is what the theme is. This is what this book is trying to say. But I don't think of that first. And what's been interesting to me is that I can look back over, I think I've written 45 or 46 or maybe 47 books and, and they're different from one another, but I think I could look back at each of them. I'm looking behind you now at, at books that are propped there and one, all the characters in that one are mice. Uh, and so it's not like the one next to it, which is a little girl in World War II. Uh, and yet both of those, I can see that the same thoughts, this, the same ideas are pervasive in them. And so that must be what's part of me that goes into the books, but I don't consciously put it there. Oh, that's so fascinating. Absolutely. Um, what, do you have any advice that you give for beginning writers? I tell them to read. <laughs> Uh, you know, that's really, uh, if people who love writing, uh, love reading and love language. I would give a different answer to a kid, and this has happened, who comes to me and says, I want to be a writer so I can be famous and rich. That's a whole other thing. And for one thing, writers, unless you're Stephen King, say, or, you know, there are, what's her name, uh, Rowling, who wrote Harry Potter. There are a couple of writers who became famous and rich. Most writers aren't and don't. And so if they want that, they, they ought to go into some other profession. Um, but kids who want to write already love stories, love language, love books. And so I, I can't really tell them anything that they don't already know and that they're not already doing. Wonderful. Yes, absolutely read. Come to the library, so check out some books, <laughs> right? Um, okay, so we do have another question. Um, so uh, they, I've always liked Summer to Die. Was that difficult to write? Uh, 
that was my very first book. And I think often, I, I don't know this, I've never done research, but often someone who sits down to write their first piece of fiction, first novel, will use something from their own experience. I, you could tell from what I showed and what I said that I was very close to my sister who was three years older. She was my best friend and my, and my sidekick and my partner in crime often, and, um, and my mentor and my teacher. Uh, and she died young. And so when I sat down, I was asked by a publisher to write a book for young people and uh, not given a topic. I, I had to think up what I would write. And, and I think I had been telling that story to myself for a long time, the story of my sister's death. Uh, you, you kind of sort, when you have a, an event that, that is so uh, strong, so powerful in your, in your own memory, you, you relive it, you go over it and you try to figure it out. Why did it happen? How did it happen? Could it have happened differently? And, and I had done that so often. And so when I sat down to write that first book, which had no title when I wrote it, <laughs> the publisher had asked me to write a book. I wrote that story, Two Sisters. I'm the younger one. It's about the death of the older sister, the effect on the whole family. I gave them the manuscript. They had not promised to publish it, but then they called and said, yes, they, they liked it and they would publish it. And they, they said, but she didn't put a title on it. They said, we'll drop a contract. They sent me a contract. And in the section where it's supposed to say the title, it said untitled. And I couldn't think of a title. And uh, I've always hated that title, uh, but I still can't think of a better one. At any rate, I, the, over the years, that book has had a number, it's still in print after all these years, uh, it's had a number of different covers, and I like the one it has now, which is plain blue with a flower on it. And there's a lot of flower imagery in the book, and, and this is my favorite of its many covers. There is also a paragraph in that book, which sadly, many, not many, but a number of people who have lost a child have written to me and asked permission to read that paragraph at a funeral. Uh, and of course, uh, I, I always am honored to have them do so, but it's a wonderful feeling to, to, to think that some words that you have written are a help to, to someone. Uh, some years ago, I got a letter from a man who had two children, son, high school senior, daughter, 14 years old. Son had died during his senior year of high school in September, beginning of his senior year, the boy had died. And the, the father wrote to me uh, to tell me that at Christmas time, the 14 year old sister had given her parents, had framed, she had done it in calligraphy and it was that paragraph from that book. And they were asking, he was asking my permission to, to use it in some way, I've forgotten how. But anyway, I was very touched by that. Years passed and I was speaking in some other city and I was signing books afterwards and a man stood off to the side and waited till all these people had their books signed. And then he came up to me and he said, you won't remember me, but my name is blah, blah. And I said, I remember you. And I said, I remember your, your daughter's name. How is she? And he said, she has five children now. Uh, that's how many years had passed, but that man had felt that connection. Uh, At any rate, to, to, be, to be a writer is to be a solitary person who's in isolation, whether there's a pandemic or not. And to make that connection through a book is, is very touching and remarkable. Yeah. And I'm taking too much time. I'm talking to Oh, it's to okay. Them. Books are so powerful in our life. They can really be life changers. And I know we're at time. I do have one last question. Um, okay. And this is actually more of on a personal note. Um, so I actually connected with Number of the Stars when I was in elementary school. And um, my family is actually from Denmark. So I'm first generation here. And so I'm you're- Norwegian. Norwegian. Yeah. Uh, and so- uh, Really, uh, your book opened up a part of history for me that I was unfamiliar with. Uh, so is there someone that you read that opened up your eyes to the world uh, as your books do for kids today? 
Uh, yeah, I, I can answer that uh, because I've thought about it often. And it was a book, it's still out there, uh, but it was a book published for adults, but I think it's now often, I don't know if kids read it still, but I, I see it in, in young adult sections of bookstores and it's called The Yearling by Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings. My mother read it to me when I was eight years old. I certainly could read myself, but it was an adult book. She had read it, she perceived that I would react to it as she had. And she read me that book and we wept together. It was the first book that made me aware of what literature can be. Cause I'd been reading Mary Poppins up till then. Nothing wrong with Mary Poppins, but it is not great literature. And this, this book was. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. We are at our time and uh, we very much appreciate you doing this author talk with us for the Lewiston Public Library today. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you, Sarah. It's been a pleasure to be with you. All right. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you everyone for joining uh, and have a great one. Thank you so much.